Oh, good morning, good morning. How are you all doing? Oh, very good. How many of you are coming to Gids for the very first time this morning? Oh, I love seeing that. Good morning, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, how many of you have been here before? Ah, uh, two years, five years, ten years, anyone? Wow. I remember you, I remember you, it's so good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're starting the, uh, things off this morning in a slightly different way. We're, um, we're going to have a conversation here, and this is going to be intimate, even though you and I are, um, you Pretty know, b- b- a position stage, you know, uh, uh, are far away from each other. But, uh, John, thank you so much for uh, joining us here this morning. It's, it's a pleasure, pleasure having you. Um, we're going to talk about interrupt, which you're, mm-hmm. you have a passing familiarity with, is that right? That's right, so yes. I'm getting increasingly familiar oh, with Oh, even that. better, yes. And we're going to talk about pods, and we're going to talk about solid, but I'd like, to, I'd like to roll back for a moment, if we would. I'd like to start um, at, at the beginning. Um, I want to tell you about my first experience with the web, and then I'd like to hear uh, yours as well. Um, I graduated from university in 1993. And in 1995, Netscape Navigator 2.0 was released. And that profoundly influenced me as a developer. That literally set the path that I've been on for the rest of my life. Netscape Navigator 2 introduced Java to the world. Uh, It introduced JavaScript to the world. But it also popularized the web. That was my Mm -hmm. first real world experience with that. and as I said, it, it, it changed my trajectory as a developer. What was your first experience with the web? You know, it was somewhat similar. I mean, to say that it's influenced the majority of your professional life, it's so true for me. And particularly when I think about the companies I've run, that they, none of them would have existed without the web. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, and, and, and I'm not alone in that. Lots of entrepreneurs around the world have built fabulous businesses uh, by virtue of the web. So uh, I will tell you, though, my first experience, I was working for a software company called Symantec. Okay. And, uh, and I was working for them in Holland, and I was approached by a new startup who were looking for a, a chap to become the general manager for Europe. And I, I just didn't get it. I mean, they, they, they explained to me what it was all about, and I just... There are three W's, right? WWW, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. yeah. I, and that was Netscape. So <laughs> I guess if I'd have taken the job, things might have worked out a little bit differently. Oh, but but uh, I wouldn't have had the fun I've had along the way, I'm sure. But. Uh, well, one area where you and I differ in our professional careers is uh, you actually know Sir Tim Berners-Lee. I do. I've never met him. Tell me about how you first met uh, uh, Tim. Yeah, you, you, so, so uh, I mean, I'm sure he needs no introduction, right? I mean, everybody, we all know because we, we were students of history somewhat, and, 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 and we know that he invented the web. And uh, he actually, though he's a, a fellow Brit, he, he was um, living in a town next to mine ah. in the USA. Uh, and, uh, and I got a call one day. Somebody said, uh, would you like to have dinner with Sir Tim Berners-Lee? And I don't know about you all, but, but I thought, well, sure, of course. I'd love to meet the man who invented <laughs> who, the web. Who turns who, who dinner with right? the night, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so we met for dinner. And he explained to me what he was trying to do. And, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, later on, yes, I, I hope. Um, but he explained to me what he was trying to do, and, uh, and I felt exactly the same way initially I'd felt many, many years ago when I'd been approached by somebody who were looking for a general manager to run Europe for them. <laughs> uh, and I felt that I sort of kind of understood it and sort of kind of didn't. And mm-hmm. so I went to school on an after dinner, and, uh, and I was thrilled that he and I then decided we would start a company together. And, uh, and we would call it Inrupt, and its mission would be to change the web. And, and as challenges go, as an entrepreneur, that's, that's, it's, it's pretty challenging, but, but, uh, but very, very doable. Well, I'm glad you set your sights low, right? Mm-hmm. You only right. want to change the fundamental right. way we uh, deal with the web. Um, one way that I feel that the web has, has changed significantly in some ways, but also remained the same, is that the web is, is deeply personal. 
Mm -hmm. And for several years now, I've been speaking here and, and uh, working professionally with conversational UIs. And I think being able to speak to uh, an agent on your phone, whether it's Siri or Cortana or Alexa or Bixby or, 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 or. Gartner says 30% of our interactions these days are, are conversational. I think that makes it deeply personal and sometimes implies a level of trust yep. um, that is either earned by mm -hmm. the agent or not. But um, do you spend your time dealing with conversational UIs? Do you talk to your phone? Do you walk into a room and speak into thin air if there's a well, smart will, speaker you, in the room? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you that uh, three of the companies I've had were security companies, cyber ah, security companies. Yes. Actually, my last company, uh, my, my uh, CTO was a guy called Bruce Schneier. And, uh, and he, you know, I've been a student of security for many years, cyber security, and, 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 uh, and I can tell you that the, the, the examples, and you know them, as increasingly they're making it into the, uh, into the press, were, were agents, uh, remote agents, working on your behalf, are actually doing way more than that. Yes. Uh, has been common knowledge amongst the security community for many, many years. And so, so I've always had a resistance to that. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of, the, one of the most, I think, exciting things about the work that uh, Tim and I are doing is that in a world of solid, which is the technology that, w that w you know, forms the backdrop for Inrupt, yes. um, agents work local to you. In that world, you can be truly sure that they're working on your behalf, not on the behalf of some remote entity who's taking your data and doing whatever they want with it. So, so yes. we created a little storyline of an AI called Charlie. Ah. And Charlie works on your phone for you using your data and nobody else gets to interact with Charlie. And I will add just a, a supplement to that. Not only is it a more safe and secure way to operate with AI, but at the self same time, it, it, it has access to data that remote agents may not. Yes. So Charlie can actually do things for you, not yet, but in a while. When, when we built it out, Charlie will do things for you that Alexa can't and Siri can't. And then it gets really exciting. Oh, it, it, it does. And, and we're at the phase right now where this is new technology, so we're just excited about the ability to speak to our phones at all. There, as I said, but when you're speaking to your phone, it, it seems to imply a level of trust yep. that maybe is earned by the other company or maybe not. Yep. I'm fine if Amazon knows that I come down every morning and say, hey, Alexa, play me some Bob Marley as yep. I walk into the kitchen. That, that's, that's fine. I feel like that's reasonably public mm -hmm. information. But if I came down in the morning and said, hey, Alexa, read me this kidney dialysis report yep. or explain this uh, latest doctor's report that, that came in, this is where privacy comes in and this is where sure. trust comes in. Yeah, absolutely. And when you couple this with accessibility issues, over 15% of the world has some form of disability. Mm -hmm. That could be vision, that could be hearing, but these agents are meant to help us. And yep. if we can't trust the agents that are helping us, that... That's going to be a problem that we need to address. 100% agree with you. Actually, and, and that's why I think that this notion of Charlie, an agent that works, I mean, I mean to play some Bob Marley is fairly trivial. I mean, sure. you, you know, we don't need a, a lot of cloud-based <laughs> AI to do that. But You can judge me on my musical taste, right? But that's a, that's a whole other conversation. I'm a big Bob Marley fan, let me tell you. Uh, but, 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 you know, uh, it's the most sophisticated AI that's, uh, that's more difficult, obviously. But, but I think that when we are buying thermostats, and uh, you know, uh, yes. and wireless cameras for the home for security, only to discover that the thermostats have got microphones in them. Or we buy a TV and we hang it on the wall so that we can give it voice commands, only to discover that it's not only sitting idle waiting yes. for the voice command, that it's listening all but the it's time. listening all the time. Yes. As a security guy, that that's hugely disturbing to me. Yeah, I mean, hugely. And that particular scenario, a TV listening all the time, that's not a hypothetical, that's no, no, not no, a that's theoretical, right. that was sure. a Samsung issue when they were first introducing that technology. Oh, absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. I'd like to talk a little bit about the read-write web. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, the read-write uh, web, but um, the web, as, as we <clears throat> experience it, is, is really fundamentally a read-only web. Uh -huh. And let me give you some numbers just to put this into perspective. There are roughly 8 billion people on the planet right now, and only about 20 million of them are programmers. So that is less than 1%. That is one quarter of 1% of the planet 
that has any kind of voice, any kind of publishing capabilities on the web, that's 99.75% of the planet that is in this kind of read-only yep. web. How does, how does Solid and, and pods like this change this equation from a read-only web to a truly read-write web? Well, you know, I, th I think what it does is it puts us back on true north for the web. I mean, the way Tim originally envisioned the web was precisely the way Solid works. I mean, it's a web where we can all share, we can all collaborate. And His original browser was a read-write browser, wasn't it? It was, yeah. The web had published capabilities mm -hmm. baked in, and right. when Netscape came out in 1995, it was, was read-only. Read only. And yeah, that right. fundamentally changed things, didn't it? Because read-write was tough for them at the time. Yeah, it is so, a hard So problem. they just cut it off and they, they went read-only. And uh, actually, as an aside, there's a really interesting TED Talk yeah, and I think the title of it is, uh, I'm the guy who said no to Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, and really? it's a TED talk, you can Google it, it's fun to watch. And, and it's a chap who was approached at a conference like this, when Tim was originally you know, advocating use of the web. It was two or three years old, not many people were really using it at that point. And, uh, and he met this guy at a conference, and, and, and this chap had built uh, a piece of technology. And Tim tried to induce him to build a browser yes. for the web. And, and, he, and he declined. He said, no, I don't get it. And, uh, and had he done so, maybe he'd be Mark Andreessen. And so, yes. uh, the, uh, but the original concept of the web was a read-write web where we can all collaborate, we can all share. And of course, that's not the way it's worked out. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, we're, we were citing some data earlier. It's not only the 30th anniversary of the web, and that was, that was uh, two or three weeks ago. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Okay, uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. But it was also, uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, the point in time where 50% <laughs> demos it. Well, we're, we're 50 it. Well, we're 50% of the world's populations on the web. Yes. And, uh, and unfortunate, it's unfortunate that the f there's 50% who are not. We've got to do something about that. Yes. Uh, but then the 50% who are uh, totally... I think so short. I mean, that's why we built Inrupt. Because the notion that we have of the web as we envision it says, and, I, and I, I will now speak to you as a business guy. Please. Not a technical guy. I mean, you know, my, my background's all business. So it's, it's building technology companies that, unfortunately, along the way, are successful to the point where people buy them. Yeah. And then I have to start again. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, it's a terrible uh, problem to have. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's tough. Uh, my last company we founded eight years ago, and IBM bought that three years ago. And, uh, but it's, it was somewhat similar to this, in as much as it was a notion about how one could do cybersecurity that nobody had thought of. And, yeah. and, uh, but it was, the, it was the practicalities of it that, that were novel, and, and I see the same now in, in where we're at with the web, which is to say the original web as envisioned was a read-write web. I mean, I think the term read-write, not many... I don't know that every developer knows of the read-write web. Yeah. I think we've all become so accustomed to the web as it is that we don't really grasp the value that it could be, the value that it could have. And, and, and again, as a businessman, I think about the web in, in the following way. There's, and this is probably oversimplistic, but the web's comprised of three big constituencies. Okay. There's end users like you and I and, and everybody here. And we want to do stuff. I mean, we want to, we want to share our ideas. We want, to, uh, you know, we want to collaborate. We want to create. We want to innovate. Yeah. And that was the way the original web was. It was a hugely innovative time. Everybody was dreaming up new ideas and trying them out. And it was fabulously innovative. Um, so end users, I think, uh, constituency one. Constituency two, the organizations that want to service us. Big companies, organizations the world over want to service us. And then the third big constituency are you all, the developers, the glue that bind it all together, that make it all work. And, and if you look at where the web is today and why we're all so short, it's because each of those constituencies is compromised. I mean, let's start with the users. The users the world over, okay, so we can talk about the challenges we all face with privacy issues, security issues, the fact that we're, manipula we're manipulated somewhat by the big by the big vendors who've got our data and, and choose to use it to their own aims, not ours. Um, but, but more importantly for me, if I look at my phone, I've probably got 80 applications on it. Yes. And each and every single one of them 
has a view of me which is very myopic, very blinkered. It, 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 you know, they'd serve me in one particular way. And then, and then I go on to the next application that services me in one particular way. And if you look at the confluence point of that, it's me and my yeah. phone, and yet I, I have to interact with all these disparate apps. And to, for each one, you have to say, hi, I'm John. Hi, I'm yeah. John. You have to reintroduce yourself 100%. every time. Yeah. 100%. And so I'm compromised, and if I want to switch from one application to another application, I have to start all over. Yes. I mean, I don't take any of my history with me. It's a complete restart. And generally, when I switch from one application to the other, I'm switching from one myopic application to a replacement myopic application. And yet again, I'm the confluence point of all that. In simplistic terms, that device in my hand has access to all the data pertinent to me Yes. And yet I have to intermediate to it all. So, so I'm hugely compromised, I believe. This isn't the way it needs to be. And then if I look at the second constituency, and uh, you know, I travel the world, fortunately enough, talking to major organizations who will tell me you know, the challenges they've got with cybersecurity and privacy. And for the last couple of years, I asked them a supplementary question, which is, what would it be like if you didn't have to take customer data? What would it be like if you didn't have to provision huge security infrastructures and be, be you know, cognizant of GDPR and, and similar privacy regulations? And you're talking hypothetically about a shoe manufacturer, right? What if a shoe yeah, yeah, manufacturer yeah, exactly right. didn't have to be concerned exactly right. about preserving my privacy and exactly preserving right. my password? And, and they'd take it in a heartbeat. Yes. They would. They would and the world over, they tell me that, well, given the choice, of course, we'd rather spend all our resources designing a better shoe, yes. building a better shoe, selling a better shoe, <laughs> and satisfying our customers. But of course, that's not the way the web works, John. The way the web works is we have an obligation to take all this customer data. We, and I think along the way, actually, somewhat people got uh, bamboozled a little mm. by the notion that it was all about gather as much data as you possibly can. Because, you know, the more data you get, the better you can perform and you can be competitive and yada, yada, yada. Yes. I mean, my life at IBM is a pretty good example. IBM, incidentally, I love that. I think it's a fabulous business. Let me not, you know, give you any, any uh, idea that it's not. But, but at IBM, I probably logged into, I don't know how many, two dozen applications to of do course. my job. Because every piece of that data that they were assembling existed in silos. And I was, again, the glue to it all. Yes. It was just crazy. So, so anyway, the second, second constituency, massive organizations who say, the world over, given the choice, we'd trade in a heartbeat. If we could service our customers without this overhead of obligation in, uh, in terms of data, we'd do it, but it's not the way it works, right? Right. And then you beg the question, well, what if it did? What if you didn't have to do that? What would that be like? We'd take it in a heartbeat. And so the third constituency developers, I mean, you know this way better than me. You're developers, I'm not. But... But I've talked to many, many of them who tell me that, you know, yeah, well, this is how it works. We will, uh, and I'm oversimplifying it somewhat, but, but our role here is to build an application to, to get data from our customers or from our, our users that then we can, we, we can work upon and deliver back value. Yes. And as a consequence of which, we have a relationship, direct relationship with this customer, and we take their data and we look after that, we provision the back end and so on. And, and I said, well, what happens if you wanted to take data from the knowledge of the fitness app, and the calendar, and their diet, and their health, what would, what would that be like? And the general answer was, well, it would A, be fabulous, but B, it would be a nightmare. Yeah, it would be fabulous, but I don't know that I would trust any one organization with it. all that information. Sure. You just would. I, Possibly my doctor has the most trust in me, but am I going to trust Fitbit? Right. Am I going to trust my grocery store to make sure that I'm eating well that complies with my doctor's office? Absolutely, Absolutely right. not. That's, that's Absolutely an right. inappropriate level of sharing with right. organizations like that. And then, of course, then it burdens you with the obligations of APIs and managing how am I going to take you know, access via these APIs to these disparate sets of data, mash them together, and then you know, render a resultant. And so, so, so developers are totally compromised. And that's why Tim invented Solid. That solid sits right in the middle of those three big constituencies. It releases end users from all the concerns. It gives them total adaptability to different applications. Yes. Frees them up from all of this you know, concern. That, and we've, you've mentioned it a few times this morning about who's got my data and what are they doing with it. Do I really trust them and so on. Yeah. Uh, organizations the world over, it liberates them. They no longer have to take customer data. They can go back to building and sell and choose. And developers now can work in a world where, think of it as one API 
the accesses a broad spread of data made, made permissioned by an end user to the application to render value. Yes. And, and you don't need to worry about provisioning all the back end. You mm -hmm. can expect that via that one API, you can access all that data in a common way. It, it's totally different. It, it, just as an aside, we, uh, we're doing a lot of development work. That's, of course we are. That's, part <laughs> That's of what, we what you do. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and we go through this interesting exercise with developers. And I see also in the open source community, you know, this originally was the, was the culmination of many years of work that uh, Tim oversaw at MIT mm. until about a year ago and we spun it out and, and when we founded the business. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but the community now is blossoming. There's a lot of people coming to the open source effort. And I see it there, but I see it more particularly in the developers that we hire. And what happens is they'll come to the company, they're enthusiastic about the opportunity not, not to be involved in a big business. I think that's obviously interesting to them, but, but to create applications that, that are impossible today. Yes. I mean, to do things that are just literally impossible. And that's hugely exciting, I feel. But, but developers come to us, and they're fairly new to the world of solid. And, and we have daily stand-ups. And they go through the first couple of weeks. You can tell the frustration, and the, you know, the, they're grappling with some new paradigm shifts in how they build apps. And, and then one day they come, and it's totally different. One day they come, and they can't wait to tell you how their day went yesterday, yes. because the light bulb goes off, they try something and it works, and then they fundamentally get it. Then they fundamentally get what this can do and, and the, the opportunities it creates. And, and it's fascinating to watch and exciting to watch. And part of what we're trying to do for developers is to encapsulate that. Yes. To do it in such a way where folks, when they come to this, don't need to go through you know, a six-week learning process to get to the point where they can build an app in their lunch break, but rather they can more quickly assimilate what's required, test it out, get a flavor for what's possible, and then, and then really embrace the technology. So, um, yeah, it's just it's fascinating to watch that education process people are going through. And, and I don't know if you're aware, but we're doing that same education process to you right now in the audience. When I first looked at Solid, I said, well, wait a second. These are just RESTful APIs. I get that. We've been doing uh -huh. that for years. You know, this is yep. the semantic web. This is linked data. I, I get that, that we've been doing this for years. These are URIs. This is identity through web ID. So all of the principles behind Solid, which is social linked data, which is what we're talking about yep. up here. All of the technological underpinnings are well understood and have been around for decades. So Absolutely right. this epiphany that you talk about your developers, it's really hard to get because if we focus on syntax and we focus on the tools that we're using, it's hard to fully grasp the real potential of solid right. because it looks like the development we've been doing all these years already. And in some respects, you're right, it is. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's all based on existing web standards. And ex with modicum of exception, you know, there are some areas that we're adding to the standards of course. right now because, you know, specification is an all-encompassing. And particularly when we go into the enterprise environment, the, there's work we need to do there. But again, it's all conducted with the W3C, so it's all web standards. Uh, and, I love uh, it. And, uh, but you're absolutely right in saying that to a great extent, it's, it's specs and standards that have existed, but it's a reconfiguration of Yes. Them. I mean, it's almost like, you know that movie where you take the red pill or the blue pill? and <laughs> It's a little like that. I yeah, mean, it really yeah. is. It says, well, hang on a minute. It doesn't need to be this way. Just put your head in a place which considers the option of going here rather than there with exactly the same components, pretty much. And that's the potency. That's the beauty. Yes. Actually, that's the brilliance of Tim with Solid. You know, again, somewhat. And, and I've been fortunate to talk to some of the folks who were with Tim with the first version of the web. And, and they said, you know, he'd come into the office and he, and he was obviously excited about it. And he would describe what he was doing. And, and it was tough to argue with him because not many people understood what he was talking about. <laughs> Be because you need to embrace a, a, a totally different vision. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't want to make it sound like a cult, but, but, but it's, it just takes the existing web infrastructure and with a modest degree of, of repositioning we unlock the potency of it. Yeah. I mean, it's fabulous. It really, really is. The simplicity is the brilliance, actually. So in, in 2005, uh, Tim O'Reilly, the publisher of, of O'Reilly Books, um, we have probably all have a number of those animals on our, on our bookshelf. Um, he coined this phrase that I, that I really like. I find very uh, 
uh, inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. his, his blog post was about Web 2.0. And again, in 2005, this is roughly 10 years into the revolution. So we've been 10 years into kind of understanding what the web is all about. And in 2005, this is when Google Maps was first introduced and Ajax. This is when blogs and wikis were, were first in. And so what uh, Tim O'Reilly um, tried to describe this whole second wave of web development, he described it as the architecture of participation. Yep. And I love that turn of phrase, the architecture of participation. Mm -hmm. Because what you and I have been talking about up to this point, we've been touching on the idea of web identity. Mm -hmm. Who are we? Yep. We've been touching on security and privacy and having agents working on our behalf. But what's really crucial to all of this, you can have all those things, but if it's not participatory, if it's not encouraging right. you to publish to the web, not the read-only web, but again, the read-write web. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this idea of the architecture of participation? Does that, does that fit into the solid and positive? Oh, it totally resonates. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the notion is that in a, in a world of solid, Everybody gets to participate. Yes. Uh, and the premise. So that ninety-nine point seven five percent of the planet that doesn't that have publish today. rights that right. that opens it up, and now everyone yeah. Everybody, is a publisher. Yeah. You know, it, 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 if you remember some years ago when blogs were fairly new, and, and we all thought the world was going to be a blog platform. I mean, everybody was going to create their own content and attract others to, to consume it, and, and, and by dint of which we'd all get better educated and so on. And, and, and then along the way, it, it sort of got sideswiped again. Yes. Uh, and I think that's part and parcel of the essence of Solid. It says users not just can, can become content creators and to do it simply, but actually as a consequence of which they can generate self-worth. Uh, we, we, we've been working, you know, obviously we're a commercial business, so a lot of the activity we have underway are with major organizations around the world who want to deploy solid for their customers so so they want to you know provide better health care or better financial services and so on and so forth so you know big organizations who have a you know a, 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 a you know a direct line between where they are today and where they want to get to with happier customers better profitability all that sort of stuff but but when I mentioned to you earlier that, you know half the world's population is not on the web this is a way to embrace those folks too. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, particularly in, you know, and you'll know in your country, in India, you know, the, the mobile usage here is amazingly... Yeah, 70 to 80% of folks in India use their mobile phones as the primary way of accessing sure. the internet. Yeah, yeah. That is deeply personal. You have the yeah. internet in your pocket. Right. And, and, you know, I think we're getting to a point very soon where it'll be the way where you transact. It'll be the way where you share. I mean, it'll be primary, you know, a device to, to interact with Everybody socially, uh, and uh, uh, some of the work we're doing is is non-profit related. So, so we've worked with um, a Mastercard on a big project called Pomoja uh, for refugees around the world. So, but it, it gives a, ref, a refugee as they traverse borders an identity, because part of the essence of Solid is a is a construct called your web ID. Yes. Everybody, I mean, uh, not to oversimplify it, but, but you, you folks may not have had a chance to look at what, how Solid's composed, but everybody, just as a corporation has a URL, every individual has one on a URI. Yes. Uh, and it's a way to uniquely identify everybody on the planet. So now we have identity, so we now have a way of, of knowing who you are. Yep. Unambiguously. Yep. Uh, and it will interface to any other ID system. So country, and we're talking to a few countries now who have their own ID system, digital ID system, and what they'd like to do is to figure out what next. And what next is with solid, okay, now you've got your digital ID, or you got your web ID, unique identifier. You have a, a personal storage area called your pod. Pod, yes. Yeah, your personal online data store. And in your pod goes all your data. But, but then you can permission who or what can have access to it. You decide who or what gets access to your data, and nobody else does. And that creates some really interesting value creation opportunities for those who might not otherwise have them. So if you create content, and others want to consume it, and you have a they micropayment can. system, they yeah, can. and the micropayment system exists to do it, then guess what? You can get value out of your content, and you can be truly creative. So it's that notion of reaching out to users, 
by dint of a web ID, it gives them a digital identity, and then as they ha have their pod and they add data in their pod, it gives them an, more than just an identity, it gives them a presence, a digital presence. Now they have a personality, they have a life on the web in a way they otherwise would not, and they can create content of m merit and value to others, and, and as a consequence of which, they can generate self-value. Yes. I mean, it's a, it really is, a, a, I think, for those folks who aren't in that position, I mean, Somewhere we're all fortunate. We're in the high-tech business. We're the privileged few, by comparison, who get to build software, market software, sell software, do whatever, you know. But, 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 but overwhelming majority of folks aren't that fortunate. Yes. This is a construct which gives them that. Gives them a chance to participate. So the 50% of the population who don't get a chance to participate, this is their chance. The 50% who are compromised or feel they are because of privacy issues, security issues, being manipulated, being fed false news, we get to straighten that out too. And again, all based on existing web standards, just configured in a different way. Yes. You know, somebody said to Tim, oh, you're trying to turn the web upside down. And he said, I'm not. I'm trying to turn it right side up. I love it, yes. And it's true. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So, so to recap so far, we've introduced you to the ID, idea excuse me, of web ID. So you now have a URI, a way of unambiguously identifying yourself. In this world of fake news and, and, and things like that, we've, that that's, that's kind of one solution. Yep. We've uh, discussed the idea of solid, which is social linked data, which is a way that we can begin interacting. We can transform this to a read-write web in a, in a way that uh, is secure and privacy-relating. Uh, and then PODS is what we just introduced there. And again, PODS stands for what? Personal Online Data Store. Personal Online Data Store. So now this is a place for us to store this information. Yep. And this feels like a good opportunity to bring up Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, because when I talk to a lot of people about Getting the agency, the getting your voice back on the web, getting the opportunity to publish. People say, well, if, of course I can publish my voice. I can publish my voice on Facebook. Yeah. Um, Facebook was founded in 2004, very much of this Web 2.0 kind of generation. Uh, in 2006, it had its first privacy outcry that Facebook at the time had 8 million people, and 1 million of those 8 million people were very concerned about privacy, that, 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 they were, they, that their personal data was being inappropriately shared, not in their best interest, but in Facebook's best interest. Mm -hmm. um, in 2007, uh, Facebook had their first class action lawsuit that they settled for about $10 million. Now, um, that was a brief um, introduction to, to the history. If, if you'll indulge me um, for just a moment here, um, let me make sure, oh, make sure my voice doesn't uh, fall off here. Um, I've got a list here of um, all of Facebook's um, uh, privacy um, concerns and, and lawsuits. So if you'll give me a moment, oh, wow. I'll, just, um, <laughs> I'll just read um, the highlights to you, okay? And it's small print. I and and small print as well, right? This is, this is legitimate. This is truly one article. Um, and and I'm, I'm certainly not going to read all of this to you, but um, as we mentioned, in 2004, Facebook is launched. In 2006, Facebook launches Newsfeed, which is the first privacy concern. In 2007, Facebook launches Beacon, which is putting your online purchases and video rentals on your newsfeed. That was the $10 million class action lawsuit that they paid out. Um, in 2009, Facebook revises its term of service to state that users can't delete their own data. And when they leave the service, their data must stay behind. It's mm -hmm. not theirs. This is your photos. These are photos of your children and your birthday and now your online purchases and video rentals. And we could go on and on again, but in 2009, uh, the, uh, Facebook makes a range of uh, changes to their personal policies that turns the data public by default. And on and on, whether we're in Ireland, whether we're in Norway, whether we're in all of these countries, over and over again, it's a story of taking this data and making it public inappropriately. 
Um, if we had more time, I would read um, all of that to you. But that was just through 2018, by the way. It didn't include 2019. But most recently, we discovered that Facebook um, was asking users to provide their email to their account yep. that was indistinguishable from a phishing attack. But Facebook was asking its own users to provide their own passwords. And then, oddly enough, those passwords were stored plain text, and Facebook used that to uh, compromise the contact information of 150 million users. So, um, Interrupt is obviously just a Facebook clone, right? You're gonna, you're gonna follow Facebook's <laughs> uh, rule book for that? Or, or how, does, how does Interrupt contrast the Facebook experience with the vast majority of people are experiencing today? Uh, well, you know, I, I, first let me say, I mean, uh, the, obviously Facebook's challenged. Yes. Uh, but, but they're a huge and successful business and they're driven by by you know their shareholders and to make a profit and so on, and I think they're doing seem to be doing an exceptional job of that. But but along the way they're fighting with some of the issues that the you know they're clearly facing. I think you know they're a talented company, well resourced. I'm sure they'll figure a lot of it out. And uh, uh, people say to me, you know, you must spend a lot of time thinking about Facebook and the issues there. And the, and the honest answer is we don't. Really? Uh, yeah. You know, it's uh, it, we're not focused on trying to remediate or. Or, or provide a remedy for Facebook, uh, we're too busy building what we believe is right uh, to really stop to think about it, to say it like it is. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the way that Solid works, it just wouldn't provide an opportunity for me to take your data, and as a consequence of having your data, and take some other data about you that I can get publicly, you know, come to con some consideration about your likelihood to purchase, or uh, propensity to purchase, a pair of shoes, yes. uh, and then, you know, you know, bombard you with ads for shoes. I mean, Solid doesn't make an opportunity for that because you get to keep your data. And, and it's under your permission that I get to, to access it. And I don't exfiltrate it unless you grant me access. And the use cases, the only use cases that were, we've seen thus far, I will add, by the way, that Inrup's less than a year old. Yes. I mean, we, 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 we told you know, the world at large, what we intended to do uh, under a year ago, and things have gone fairly excitingly ever since, because it's clear there's a huge appetite for change. From end users who want to see changes, organizations who want to see changes, and developers who really want to see changes. Really so, want to see changes. So, if you, uh, going back to your example with Facebook, the, the way Solid works, you get to keep your data, and the only examples we've seen thus far of users being prepared to give up their data to allow it to go off into the hands of somebody else. There's two examples, actually. One is for societal benefit. And we've seen this for research. In the farmer industry in particular, in order for them to come to some conclusions about the efficacy of drugs, which they'd like to do, uh, just as an aside, uh, I don't know if anybody here is in the pharma business, but, but they generally fly blind. You know, they create these drugs, yes. and they hope they're going to work, and they do a mod modest amount by law, all that's allowed to, to test the efficacy of the drugs, and then they the, the produce them and roll them out. And, and there are hardly any ways they can test how well they're working. They get to know when they're not, but, but generally it's tough to, to, to gauge how well they're working. So, so the pharma industry would love an anonymous way to interact with society to both field test drugs more efficiently, for the better of all of us, yes. and then to determine just how efficiently they're working or how a a efficient they are in, in remediating the symptoms and so on, that you've got your illness and so on. And, and, and so in that example, the, the trade would be, give me some of your data. I will aggregate it with everybody else's of pe people who in need to use my drug. Yes. And then as a consequence of that aggregation, I can give back results for the community benefit. And, and if they do that sincerely, I think that's a fabulous example where you relinquishing your data for the betterment of everybody is a fur and healthy trade. But it's, it's my decision. It's a, your determination, absolutely right. And, and then the second use case we're seeing is, um, is those that, that would be happy to participate. Actually, there's a fairly significant one like this in India, as it happens, where, where the, the, the use case is everybody gets to participate, and those who choose to participate to the next degree can, can trade their participation in the overall Relink, le, releasing some of their data for financial gain. They, uh, and it takes various forms. One, one short example is, 
you know, the, the, the uh, marketeers around the world, when I was one actually, uh, when the web first really started to, to become adopted, we used to love marketing on the web because it was so new and novel, the response rates we'd get oh, by sending you roof. Were, were um, astronomical. But fast forward to today, and it's, you know, point zero zero. What, yes. I mean, it's ridiculous, yes. right? Uh, and if you offer markets here a choice between a world of taken aggregated data provisioned by various sources and come to some conclusion and then mar blank, blanket marketing to you versus somebody out there who says, I have, an in let's, I have an interest in buying a pair of shoes. The individual who puts their hand up and says, I have an interest in buying a pair of shoes is inordinately more valuable than, than somebody who... Than spamming 100 million 100%. people and hoping for 100%. that fraction of 1%. 100%. To so the second use case we're seeing uh, good examples of is where users say, okay, then I'll participate. For fair return, signal an, uh, an interest in some, some service or product, and if I'm treated fairly and appropriately, I'll continue to participate that way. And marketing departments love the idea of that. Because that relationship's all much more balanced and healthy and much more efficient one. Because it's not spamming everybody, it's, it's actually engaging in a hopefully productive dialogue with somebody who has an interest in your product or service and getting to a conclusion, either positive or negative, in a very professional way. And so, aside from those examples where you will give up your data to a third party, we've, we've yet to see any others. But again, this, this change in the web is huge, and we're only beginning to see it. Yes. What's most exciting when, as an entrepreneur, I think about the web, and, and I, uh, you know, my role as, a, as the CEO of Inrupt is to try and, try and see if I can't help spawn an ecosystem. An ecosystem that will be pod providers, app developers, stores, I mean, uh, almost a do-over of the web that exists today with a lot of the existing participants, but with a lot of new ones. Yes. New ones that are yet to be created. New ones that might be in this room right here, right now, who say, you know what? That was interesting enough for me to go and spend a little bit of time looking at it. And then you create a business with a new business model that's not about taking user data and, and selling it to advertisers, yes. but it's a new one. It's a novel one. It's got some characteristics that have yet to be tested in the cyber world. And that is the most exciting thing of all. So those use cases that I give you an example are up? Yes. Early, 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 early days of the next 30 years of the web. And, and what's most exciting is the thought, just the thought, that in five years, I'm going to get an email from somebody in this room who sends me an email and says, you won't remember, but I was at this, this I thing was you there. Did, I was at Gids. And I left, and me, me and these two other people, we started this company, and, and we're thrilled that it's got millions, if not billions, of customers. And, and that's what's most exciting about all this, actually, that thought that there's a change of common. Yes. And it is common. Yes. I mean, the decentralization of the web is absolutely going to happen. I guarantee it. I absolutely guarantee it. Now, will Solid Interrupt be the cornerstone of that? I'd like to think we've got a major role to play in it, but it's coming anyway. And, and if you embrace it now, you're back when the web was, you know, at CERN, running on a single server. Tim, you know, nobody had heard of. And, yes. and that's the stage we're at. We're at a, it's truly exciting, actually. We, we are early stages right now. And so if I go to interrupts.com right now, mm -hmm. yep. um, my onboarding experience is going to be much like what you'd experience with a Facebook or a Twitter or a Snapchat or an Instagram. Yep. I will create an account with you. Um, I'll provide some level of personal information, whatever I'm, I'm comfortable with. But the difference is when I go to interrupt.com, I'm establishing my web ID through a well-known yep. URI at that point. Yep. I am establishing a pod where I can begin creating that information. Yep. Right? What else, am I, what, what else is my interrupt experience like at this point? Uh, today, if we go out right now and go to interrupt.com and create an account, first of all, will you charge me for it? No, 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 no. Will you no. ever charge me for it? Uh, I, I wouldn't charge you for that, no. I mean, okay. I, I, what I imagine we'll charge for are things yet to be created. 
and, and you can go to interrupt.com slash SDK, actually. So, so zero in on the SDK because we're, we're, we're building out the SDK as fast as we can so that, you know, that it will provision new developers with an experience that's a lot better than the one that was six months ago. And it will be nowhere near as good as the one that's going to happen in six more months. So, yes. So, yes. so, you know, it's fast evolving and the community is weighing in. So, so I would encourage you, go to inrupt.com slash SDK and take a look at what we've got. But, but you're absolutely right. At this point, we, we, we spun it out of MIT and we've been attending to it with as much energy and effort and resources as we can. It's changing fast, actually. It's getting yes. much more robust and much more consumable by new developers. And uh, but, but you won't be charged for that. You, we, if you could join the you know the various Gitter chats, the, the, we used to get about five posts a week in Gitter, and now we get about 500 a day. Oh my! It, it was running at around 5,000 a day when we originally you know broke news on Enrupt, but now it's calmed down a little. Ah. Uh, but 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 f I think what's partly exciting in all this is. Uh, Tim's in there, because at heart he's still a developer. I mean, he's never happier than when he's developing code. So, so uh, you can go in there and pop a question, and so Tim Berners-Lee pops might, up and answers your question. Answer that. Yeah. yeah, you're playing guitar with Keith Richards. You're, <laughs> you know, you're, uh, you're, you're, but, but it's that's the joy of it. That's the excitement of it. It's yeah. raw. It needs a lot of work, not by big, massive organizations who want to weigh in, but but by people like you. People who say, you know what, I'm going to give this part of my time and energy. And you put your shoulder to it, like the other open source contributors are. And it's all open source. Inrup doesn't own this. It's, it's all open source. We're giving everything to the community at this point. So, so uh, you can do that safe in the knowledge that nobody's going to steal your ideas. Or Actually, the inverse is true. We just had a, uh, our first startup boot camp. Oh, really? So we invited people to come for two days. And a bunch of cust uh, companies came. Uh, uh, companies, by companies, I mean three people. <laughs> who had an idea, or maybe, you know, three people who had an idea and they were thinking of pivoting it to solid. And, and we spent two days talking about how we can help, how we can help them get it funded, how we can help them with marketing support, how we can help them by sharing more intimately the roadmap for solid. And, uh, and we'll continue to do that every three months. So, and if you're remote or you can't, you know, attend physically, then, then uh, you will do it online, a lot of it. And so, uh, so the whole notion is to help the, the, the open source development community come to Enrupt, come to Solid, and experience it, safe in the knowledge that it's getting better day by day, largely because of the contributions we're getting. Uh, but but it's please don't treat it as a, you know, boy, this is this is production spec because it's not. Yes. I, I describe it as an you know an advanced prototype. In parallel, Enrupt's building out a more robust version of it and we'll release that to the community later this year and again it'll all be open source and and because of the way solid specs are it will any api any apps you're building now will be guaranteed to work on the new version of the platform it'll be node.js and all that sort of stuff it's a, so everything will be common but um uh, yeah if you feel like this is a mission you want to embrace and i would hugely encourage it because it is going the world is changing Yes. The web is changing. And, and those who embrace it now, I think we'll find it exciting. We'll find it frustrating. We'll find it confusing. But it's like the web was originally imagined to be. So, so to, to recap once again, we've discussed um, WebID, which is a W3C standard, but it's a way you identify who you are on the web. Yep. We've talked about solid social linked data, which is the, how you're going to interact with folks through chat, through news feeds, through any, yep. any number of ways. We've talked about pods, which is your personal online data store where you'll store your own photos. There's no question about who owns your photos and who sure. owns your um, uh, birthday wishes and, and, yep. and things like that. And then we mentioned interrupt.com. And if you go to interrupt.com, that's a turnkey solution that I think 99.75% of the world is going to use. In fact, that you log into Interrupt, and that is where your web ID is created, and that's where your solid interfaces originate and endpoint, and that's where your pod exists. Yep. But you also mentioned the SDK, yep. which is Node.js based, which is uh, uh, JavaScript based, which is um, yep. something that you can download. And I've done that. And so you do now have the ability to download 
the, the, the SDK, the whole of the infrastructure to see how it's working to run that on your hardware, on your infrastructure rather than the other. And there's no difference in the user experience, right? Um, between running it on your hardware or running it in a hosted environment? Right. And, and we've actually got people who've run it on a Pi. So, you know, the Raspberry Pi, the, the, we've got really? people on a Pi, which is fascinating. And uh, uh, the, quite recently in Barcelona, actually, we had a university there of, of students it was maybe 40 students, and they created, independently of each other, they created about 12 chat apps using the SDK. And, uh, and it was, they were all different, and they all worked, which is another way of saying... Interoperability, uh, right? Interoperability, absolutely yes. right. So uh, it's, it's not that, you know, I'm using Messenger, so you've got to use Messenger. It's this is my chat app. It's the one I like. You've got a different one, but we can still chat. We still have a way to, to communicate absent in, 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 anybody who intermediates, it's direct, it's distributed, it's decentralized, it's private, and guess what? My favorite one and your favorite one can be two totally different ones, but they work. It's a different and, world. And this is the crux of the argument, and this is why I'm so personally excited about it, because we, we don't know the silos we're living in right. right now, but if you've ever tried to send text messages between an iPhone and an Android phone, you know that it works, but you have to shake your head like this, right? It right. works, <laughs> right? But um, when you're in the Apple ecosystem, you have a much yep. richer experience. When yep. you're in the Android ecosystem, you have a much richer experience. Yep. Um, I like um, reading uh, ebooks on my Kindle. One of the killer features for me is that I'm reading on my iPad. It remembers the last page that I've read. And so when I pick up my iPhone, it will scroll to that. But again, these experiences, I'm putting my experience in the Apple ecosystem right. or the Android ecosystem or the Amazon ecosystem, yep. or if you purchase music in the iTunes store, yep. can you play it elsewhere? So when we're talking about what Solid and Pods and Inrups has to offer, it really is turning this experience inside out, That's right? right? That all of that data is truly mine it's now. Yours. I'm not yeah. renting space. That's right. I, I'm owning, I'm a, right. I, I own my, yeah. my data, and yeah. I own my experience. And that feeling you get of, wow, that was cool, that bit of value I just got because my Kindle synced with my iPhone, oh, you know, it, yes, yes, it's yes. just like, think about the implications of that. It did one little thing, but the world we're so used to, it felt to you like it was fabulous. And, and that's how constrained end users are today. They just think that this is the way it's supposed to be, but it doesn't have to be this way. When everything, when everything is in your control and data is working for you, that little example you just cited is exactly that, a tiny little sliver of the kind of example that you can build. So this is what we're on the precipice of, right? This is the next version of the web, and what's ironic is this is not web 3.0, is it? Right, this is the way it was supposed to be. This was. And you coined it earlier. This is Web 1.0. This, this, this is Web 1.0. And that's what I love so much yeah. about this, is that this is now finally Tim Berners-Lee original vision of the web. Yeah. One that respects privacy. Yep. One that gives you agency on how to share your own data. One that is truly a read-write web, not a read-only web. And you are the publisher. These are all... Yep. 30-year-old ideas that Tim Berners-Lee had originally at CERN. This was his original vision of That's the web. That's why it was brilliant. Yes. I mean, it truly is. And, and, and developers can create applications unfettered by all the constraints we have today. And now we're back in the true value of the web where innovation rules. And you can, you can pretty much, it's limitless. The only, the only limit to the, what we can build is in the minds of you all, not determined by some monolithic business someplace who decides that you're not going to be allowed to do that. We're, uh, we're, we're done with that. Well, John, thank you so much for your time and your you're insight. Welcome. I've really deeply enjoyed this. Um, will you commit now on stage in front of everyone to join me on stage here 30 years from now so we can discuss uh, what's happened uh, based on what we uh, I'd like to think I'm going to make it that far, but yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please yeah. join me in giving John Bruce a big round of applause, Thank CEO you. of Interop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Namaste and Danyavad. We have so much more to offer you here. I am going to be talking about these concepts throughout the day. If you'll join me for the Framework Free Web, we'll talk about browser native development using only HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We'll talk about web components, and I'll also talk about web accessibility. If you are interested in adding conversation to your apps, all of this is browser native. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee minted a technology. So I hope to see you in my talks, but all of the talks we see here. Thank you once again for your thank time you. and attention. Please give yourself a round of applause.